back to my channel. For those who are new here, my name is Tanasia. I am a senior in the respiratory care program, and I'm currently working as a respiratory intern at my job that I've been working at for four and a half years. Just to give you a little background on me, I have two jobs. I found a new job that has me as a student practitioner and at this job is actually one of the clinical sites that I did my rotations at and they have never hired student therapists ever. We are the first ever students to actually get a position at this job and actually be able to implement everything that they were able to see as um, in our rotations as students to feel comfortable enough to open up positions. So this is a really big thing for us. And that is why I always told you guys that when you guys go to your clinical sites, make sure you give your best and your all because you never know, you may be the first ever students to change that facility's way of doing things where they will actually open up student positions for you guys to actually work there. So performance and first impression is always key. So always look at the fact there's a light at every tunnel, even though it may not seem that way, but if you put your hard work in, you might just actually change the way things are being ran at that facility and also open up positions and opportunities for other people who are either just entering the respiratory care program or who wish to get in the respiratory care program because they see that there's a lot of things that respiratory does that they didn't know and it can also create more and more interest towards this actual field so I've been getting a lot of suggestions that have been aiming more towards actually getting more studying tips on how to remember the different modes, when to change it, when to make adjustments, and just overall trying to find easier ways to remember what each mode means. Now, again, I've never been a good teacher on trying to explain certain things, so I'm actually going to try my best to explain this the best of my ability to what's easier for me, and hopefully it will help you guys. The main modes that I'm going to discuss on here is just basically the ones that I commonly see at my jobs, which are CMV, assist control, SIMV, pressure support ventilation, CPAP mode that can also be placed on the vent. Also, we're talking about the BiPAP as well that can be used as a ventilator too. But in order for that to happen, the BiPAP has to be put in what we call AVAPS mode. So I'm going to briefly just discuss what helps me easier, easier, easily remember because I'm getting tongue tied. Easier, easier to remember with these modes and everything that will make it more easier for you guys to remember as well. So I have two things sitting with me along with my laptop in my lap. Y'all can't see it from here. But the first thing I have is this piercings book that is an old edition that was given to me by one of the therapists that works at one of my clinical sites. So they just gave me this book as an extra resource to go through because it helped them as well. They do have other editions that's more up to date, but to be honest, the only thing that may have probably changed with the pre-existing modes that have already been used over time is maybe some advancements that have been made towards that mode. But ideally, they should all still work the same. They all mean the same thing as far as what the initial definition for all of these. So it doesn't change the meaning of the mode. It just may have been improvements been made to make it where SIMV can now do this versus what it couldn't do before. So I'm just using this as a resource and then also I have my actual Kettering book that I'm studying now to kind of help me as a guide if it's something that I end up not remembering to discuss with y'all. Um, I also had an app on my, my laptop that I wanted to show y'all that I downloaded on there if you want to play with like the settings after I get done explaining this. So I will briefly walk you guys through that. And also the app is free, it doesn't cost anything, it's no trial, it's no nothing. You have unlimited access to this app to where it will help you look at everything, see how it will help you make adjustments to the patient. They have different types of conditions that the patient can be in. So you can always make adjustments on there if you want to go on there and play with it. So like I said, I'm only gonna go over the main modes that I initially see during clinicals and at my jobs. The first thing I'm going to go over is CMV, which is control mode ventilation. The biggest key with these modes is pay attention to the names because the names itself can tell you a lot on what the mode is, 
how it works and basically what it is so again cmv control mode ventilation the biggest keyword control when you see anything that deals with control mode cmv or whatever think about control that means that the ventilator has total control over what the patient does so when you see cmv just think all vent no patient the patient cannot do anything so when you have to go in the room and there's a patient that's in cmv mode just think about when you do your ventilator checks nothing's going to change i will put everything in the vent preset title volume rate fio2 everything so when you go to the side of the vent that shows you what the patient does the patient is not going to do anything because the con the control is 100 percent the vent the vent is 100 percent in control of everything that is being delivered to the patient so nothing is going to um vary when it comes to what is preset already in the vent and what the patient does so again when you think of control mode ventilation just think all ventilator zero patient the patient can't do anything now in this instant the second mode that we're going to talk about is assist control now assist control and cmv are the exact same thing the only difference between the two is like i said cmv is the ventilator doing everything for the patient the patient can't do anything with assist control again the name assist and control the ventilator still has control but as far as the assisting part it can still help the patient if they initiate a breath the ventilator will detect that the patient is wanting a breath and it's going to assist in that and delivering that actual a breath that the patient is asking for so with that assist control that ventilator is patient triggered time triggered now with time triggered that means that what i set in the vent as far as sensitivity is going to be the time that's set on when that patient is going to get a breath patient triggered is what the patient actually initiates when it asks the vent for that breath so when the patient asks for the breath the ventilator itself is going to assist with that so regardless of what the patient asks for the patient is still going to get the breath that i have set on the vent when it's time to give that patient the breath. So at that point, it's still a situation where the ventilator is still in control, but the patient has the opportunity to initiate a breath and the ventilator assist in giving that patient that breath as well. So just think about the two modes that mean the same thing, but the only difference is assist control is a more upgraded version, a step or two ahead of what CMV can actually provide for that patient. So again, CMV is all vent, zero patient, assist control is time triggered patient triggered where the patient can still initiate asking the machine for a breath and they can assist in helping that patient get the breath that they're asking for at the same time still having control over what the patient needs to get in the time that I set on the vent to deliver that actual breath to the patient so in the third mode that we're going to talk about is SINV which stands for synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation now what that means is this particular mode gives room for the patient to spontaneously breathe on their own and the same reason of getting any type of assistance from the machine now in order for you to make an adjustment like that the patient has got to be improving in their situation in order for you to change them for example if the patient is already in either cmv or assist control and they're improving in their condition and they're actually trying to initiate way more than what the actual machine can give them that's when you start to evaluate your patient in a situation where we go in and inspection is the first thing that you have to think about when you walk in the door you have to assess your patient from the door until you get to the side of the bed so by the time you approach the patient's bed you should be able to detect what's going on what has been taking place with the patient as soon as you walked up so if you have a situation where the patient is either in cmv or assist control mode on the ventilator if you come in and you hear that vent sounding off with high pressure low pressure alarms they always say on the mbrc and kettering that if you ever hear your alarms going on going off you pay attention to what is actually setting off the vent 
the low pressure um, alarm is the most important one because that basically tells you if there's a disconnection in the circuits, if there's a situa situation where there's something going on that dictates whether that patient has been disconnected from that vent in some type of way. So, th so that is why they say the low pressure alarm is the most important alarm out of all the settings on the vent because that's basically telling you that there's some type of a disconnect somewhere and you have to find that disconnect ASAP because your patient is not ventilating or oxygenating while they're disconnected from the vent. And we all know that there's all there's not so much time or a window that you can have the patient without oxygen or ventilating because at this point, the patient's condition is worsening. So with the high pressure alarm, that means your patient is either plugging off or there's some type of obstruction. So you have to pay attention to that when you go in there and you look at that vent and your patient. So back to what I was saying before, if both the high and low um, pressure alarms are going off. That means that there's some type of asynchrony going on where the patient is trying to trigger more breaths than allowed and the vent is trying to fight it. So basically that patient is fighting that vent at this point. So at this point, you have to take a look at your patient's chest, which also falls in the category as inspection. So you're going in, expect, inspecting your patient's chest from the door to the bed. So let's say this is the patient right here. This is the patient's chest. If you walk in that room and you see the patient's chest doing this, that means there's some breath stacking going on and they're not doing this, which is the normal expansion in and out that you would expect your patient to do on inhalation and exhalation. So you don't see this and you see this, that patient is fighting that vent. And at this point, you have to keep an account that's breath stacking, which means that all the breath that they're taking in is stacking on top of each other, putting in a lot of more, a lot more pressure than that patient's lung will allow. So at this point, you're thinking about barrel trauma, which could lead to a pneumothorax, which will lead to atelectasis and all the above of every problem that will accumulate after that. So that's something you have to pay attention to. So when you see stuff like that, this is when you will come into effect of, we may need to change the modes. So with a person that's breath stacking like that and it's causing so much asynchrony with that patient fighting that vent, you need to change the modes. So in this case, this is when SIMV will come into place, which I said, you have to always pay attention to the name, like how we were able to see that control, CMV, control was the keyword, assist control, assist was the keyword, and now with SIMV, synchronized is the keyword with that. Because we all know that synchronized is just basically self-explanatory. And to use as an example to kind of show you what you could visualize to understand what it means when I say the patient is fighting the vent. Like for example, let's say, let's use synchronized swimming as an example. Okay, let's say you're at practice, y'all are learning a routine. You have about five swimmers that's doing their thing, they're practicing, trying to prepare for the tournament that they have to do in a couple of weeks. So let's say there's five swimmers, but there's one swimmer out of that five that's not really getting it. They're kind of out of whack with it. So let's say the, the four that are in sync is the ventilator and the one swimmer that's out of whack is the patient. So at this point, the one that's not getting it, that's the patient fighting against what the vent is already able to do because the vent is not going to change. The vent is going to do what's said in it. It's not going to change, but the patient is fighting with this vent. So at some point, the coach is going to have to come in, which plays the therapist, and they're going to have to change the tactics to try to get that patient to stop fighting that vent and synchronize within the other four people that are in sync, which is um, categorized as what the vent is going to do regardless. Nothing's going to change. Everybody else is going to do what they're supposed to do, but that patient is going to fight with that vent and that person is just not getting it. We have to change the tactics to try to get that patient to get in sync with the machine. We got to get the patient to work with the machine and get them to synchronize together to where they can work as one. So in this aspect, we have to change the mode. So right now the vent and the patient are not working together in assist control or CMV mode because that patient is wanting to do way more than what the vent is going to allow it to do. So at this point, we're going to change it to SIMV mode, which gives that patient a more comfortable breath. 
and also it compromises to where the vent will actually synchronize with the patient and there's no asynchrony there's no breath stacking there's no fighting the vent they're working together so let's say for example like i said simv patient trigger time trigger i can set everything on the vent but that mode actually gives room for the patient to spontaneously breathe and also initiate a breath because it allows for spontaneous breathing so let's say for example i have the time set at six seconds so every six seconds the patient is going to receive a breath from the ventilator and let's say the patient asks for a breath at four or at the five second mark those breaths are very close together so to avoid breath stacking SIMV allows for the two breath to come in sync and to give the patient a spontaneous, comfortable, true breath. So even though they're right next to each other, they're going to get in sync and they're going to give that patient a more comfortable breath. So that way there's no breath stacking. There's no fighting the vent. There's no irritability that will be causing any discomfort to the patient because we done changed the mode that was causing them to be uncomfortable to now being comfortable and now the vent has comp compromised has basically compromised with the patient to make more of a comfortable setting for the patient so it's like you basically have a more comfortable mode for the patient to be able to do what they need to do without having to be so uncomfortable fighting the vent. And then if you're not paying attention to what is actually going on, you would say, well, the patient may need to be more sedated. That's not the case. The mode needs to be changed and you have to pay attention to your patient's chest and everything that's going on. So within all of the experiences that you have, inspection is the number one thing that you have to do because every patient case is different. You can't just handle every patient the same. You have to look at every patient's case differently because every patient is gonna require a different care plan, a different parameter when it comes to the vent. Some may be able to be weaned, some may not be able to wean. So you, inspection, and full on patient assessment is the most important thing that you have to pay attention to because if you don't, it's going to be a situation that you're not going to be able to get out where you might be losing your license. You may be losing pride and you might so most definitely is going to lose confidence because you're going to think you can never do this again because your confidence is going to be so low. So with that being said, Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention to your patient. Look at your patient, inspect your patient and look at that vent and understand what's going on. But if you look at your patient, see how they're breathing, what type of situation is going on with them, you'll be able to kind of tell right then what's going on and what type of alarms is going on. So that situation, that's how you'll be able to also detect when you would have to switch because again, ABG will tell you everything. Also, SIMV is also a weaning mode and can be used as a weaning mode, but can also be used as a comfortability for the patient as well, like we just discussed a few moments ago. So don't think that, you know, SIMV is just a ventilator mode. It also can be used for weaning. Now, if a patient is in SIMV mode, you can also look at the whole clinical aspect of your patient if you've been caring for this patient for a couple of weeks can't got off on a couple of days come back same patient is still there their modes or parameters have been changed you have to also think about you and the doctor can kind of look at okay this patient has been improving they've been decreasing on the rate they're able to take good tidal volumes in tidal volumes in and also fio2 have been decreased as well so at this point the patient is close to room air so we can start talking about sbt's which is known as spontaneous breathing trials so if you guys have already started talking about that you know that the minimum time that you can have someone on sbt's is 30 minutes and the max time is two hours so at this point you want to think about 
inspecting and monitoring that patient within the 30 to two hour mark to see if they are improving, if they're doing worse or they're not handling it. And we also know you have to pay attention to a lot of things when you're doing a SBT on a patient that is on the vent. You have to look at heart rate, blood pressure. You gotta look at respirations. You gotta look at all the things that you have to hold in account when you have to discontinue the SPT or you can keep going because that dictates on how much further you can go into the weaning trial with them without them kind of going into like a frenzy because they can't sustain all the changes you've made with that trial. You have to take a look at that. There's also a huge section that is in Kettering and I believe it's also in Egan's too. So you can also read all about that. I'm not gonna get into it, but that's why I wanted to name the key factors that you have to look at because that does dictate how much you can actually keep that person in that spontaneous mode to where they can sustain the changes that you make when they start to seem like they're tolerating it, but they just might not be tolerating it at all. So um, when you're doing SPTs, if the patient is doing well, you can put them in what we call spontaneous mode, which can also be used as basically the patient doing everything on their own because there's also a mode called PSV, which is pressure support ventilation, which is basically the patient is doing everything, but they also have the support that can be given by the vent, very limited support because again, the patient is doing everything. So that is something that you have to also keep in account because if you have a person that is on a T piece, that is like the patient doing completely everything. So that is something also that you have to keep in mind as well because a lot of trach patients are on T pieces and that can also let you know if they're able to sustain the amount of time that you have them on those breathing trials. So you have to pay close attention to those trach patients as well because ET tube patients that are intubated with those, they kind of do a little bit better, but with those T pieces that I have seen, they have done a little bit worse with it to where they struggle a little bit more. So um, keep that in mind too when you're looking at that as well. Um, like I said, with spontaneous, the patient is doing everything. So if they end up doing pretty well in spontaneous mode for a while and the doctor starts to see some things and also the respiratory therapist too, then we can start moving up to where we can start talking about withdrawing back on sedations and everything else that they're getting and start talking about extubating this patient. So at this point, we all know with, you know, extubation, you have to get all your things together. You got to get a towel or a pad, whatever you prefer. You get, you know, the um, yanker ready if they don't already have one at bedside to suction around the ET tube to prevent any type of aspiration when we pull that tube because you got to also think about we got to deflate that cuff. So that cuff is separating any type of form of exchange of fluid getting down in those alveoli or anything which is messing up anything down there that could basically prolong them on the vent and cause other problems. So you have to keep that in account as well to keep everything in order the way it needs to when you have to extubate a patient. So when you're thinking about extubating a patient that is actually... Um, eligible to intubate, extubate, you have to think about doing a NIF on that patient. You have to also do RSBI. You have to calculate that to make sure it's within parameter to where it also can say that they can be weaned. The RSBI and the NIF are the two things that are looked at the most to see if they also are ready to be weaned. For NIF and Kettering, they say the normal NIF is 80 and it has to be 20 or above to still qualify for being able to be extubated and RSBI has to be 100 or less in order for them to still qualify to be extubated. So you have to also look at that too. The NIF is also known as MIP, which is maximum inspiratory pressure and NIF standing for negative inspiratory pressure. Cause you have to think about when we inhale, that's negative pressure. When we exhale, that's positive pressure. So with um, NIFs, the, the expiratory is gonna be a little bit higher than inspiratory. So with inspiratory, you have to have, the normal is 80 and it can't be no lower than 20. And what that measures is muscle strength. And that lets us know if the patient can control their secretions, if they have enough 
muscle strength to cough up secretions because if they're weak in both areas we cannot extubate them because that's like higher risk for aspiration getting some type of pneumonia anything like that that can prolong them on the ventilator so you have to pay attention to that way pay attention to that as well before you just pull the tube then for um maximum expiratory pressure that is normal for 160 and then the limited it can be is 40 so 40 or below is not good it has to be 40 or higher and that's the minimum it can be before you can actually say like okay we can extubate this patient so let's say for example rsbi is 100 or less and then you got the um NIF that is where it needs to be within reason where the patient can still be extubated you can go ahead and extubate them but before we do all that we have to get everything we need as far as the towel pad whatever you prefer prefer we have to have the suction ready and we know for adults the normal suction um, measurement is between 120 and 150 so make sure you stay within those measurements don't go under 120 don't go above 150 because that can cause trauma to the patient as well. So we want to make sure we know everything that we need to know as far as what is appropriate for the age groups of patients that you have. So that is very important as well too. Um, once we have everything set to where it needs to be, we put the towel over the patient. We have them in semi-fowlers, which is somewhere between 35 to 45 degree angle in the bed. We have to make sure that we've had all the measurements and everything written down so we can make sure we document all of that after we do the extubation. We have the empty 10cc syringe so we can use that to take all the air out of the cuff before pulling it. We have to make sure we suction around the ET tube so that we don't put the patient at risk for aspirating and then causing them to get back on the vent. We also have to make sure that the patient is fully awake, co coherent, coherent, and able to understand what we're explaining to them and able to, you know, uh, pay attention to what we're saying to them and what we need them to do before we pull this tube. So what will we would do, place the towel over the patient's chest. We suction real good. We lay the suction catheter a little bit below the towel so we can use that towel to wipe the patient's mouth after they cough or if they end up you know coughing up anything before we can suction but we're going to be a good therapist and be quick on our game with the suction so like i said towel placed over here suction catheter and everything ready with the yanker attached to it we're going to suction around the et2 we're going to make sure we let the patient know like this is what we're going to do we're going to also keep that ballard attached to the patient's et tube and we're going to suction down that down the trachea as well because regardless of what we do we have to make sure we cross our t's and dot our i's so not only are you going to suction around the um et tube you're going to suction down the patient's trachea to make sure all the secretions you get out of that as well so once we do that we're going to detach the um suction catheter from the ballard and we're going to attach it to the yanker so we can make sure we get any additional suction in that may need to be done around the et tube before we pull it so once we've done everything we're going to go ahead and take the empty tc 10 cc syringe attach it to the um pilot balloon and we're going to go ahead and deflate that cuff we're going to take before we, what I would prefer, we're going to take our stethoscope, we're going to listen around the um, trachea to see if we hear adequate air passing through the trachea. We don't hear any swelling. We don't hear any type of, you know, occlusion in there so that we would, before we pull that tube, because one thing which is the biggest risk when you're extubating someone is laryngospasm. And that's basically those vocal cords clamping down. And then at this point, we got a trachea. So I like to go the extra mile and listen to my patient's trachea to make sure I hear adequate air passing through there before we pull that tube. And if we hear anything that might detect any type of swelling, what I would suggest is doing a breathing treatment while that tube is still in that patient. So that way it can kind of take care of the inflammation that's in there before we pull that tube. And if you're good at what you do and you know what you need to do, you can suggest to the doctor like, hey, I don't hear 
actual air passing through there like it should i hear a little bit of wheezing going on so i feel like there's some inflammation in there and i don't feel comfortable pulling that tube just yet could we just go ahead and do a quick aerosol treatment to kind of get that inflammation up you know down a little bit before we pull this tube and if the doctor is comfortable with you because a lot of doctors respect therapists they will be like okay i agree with that you go ahead and do that and then we'll evaluate afterwards so once we do all of that if you inspect that there's adequate air passing through go ahead and let that patient know like we're going to go ahead and pull that tube and i just need you to make sure you follow the instructions that i give you so once they say are you ready the patient says yes nod their head or whatever we tell them to take in a really good deep breath and what that deep breath does is you're going to tell them to take a really big deep breath in and we're going to pull it so like i said that deep breath in basically gives that patient a good good cough after we pull that tube and it also prevents vocal cord damage so when you tell before you pull that tube after deflating it let that patient know take a deep breath in hold it for a couple seconds pull that tube right out and tell that patient to give me a really really big cough they cough we grab that yanker we suction out their mouth really good and we let them know like do you need to cough up some more do you feel like you need to let them cough again suction again and then once we got all of that clear and the patient feels a little bit better then we'll ask them their name they're ask them do you know where you are we'll ask them just minimum questions that we can see how their voice sounds how they're you know if there's any type of anything going on and me even though i've already consultated their um auscultated their trachea i want to do it a second time to make sure i don't hear anything just to be sure and a lot of times when we extubate a patient we will put them on two liters and we would just monitor them for a while and then we would get like a um i think we would the doctor would either make a prn or q6 hour um breathing treatments to just be on the safe side with that and if you ever feel like there's some issues where there could be emergency situations of swelling you can always give racemic epi which is basically used to kind of jump on that real quick with any type of swelling to kind of prevent any type of closed off with the to prevent that airway from closing off real fast to get that swelling down so they can continue being able to strive without having to be re-intubated but there is some cases where some patients will have to be re-intubated so that is something that you know you have to be really really quick on your feet if you suspect anything so if you have to go the extra mile to do a little extra something like i said with auscultating you know the trachea before and after extubation do that you do whatever makes you feel comfortable so that way you can go on to your next patient knowing you did exactly what you needed to do and over time once you get more comfortable with that then you'll be able to do what you need to do so also just keep in mind that going the extra mile doesn't hurt as long as it doesn't prolong your patient of oxygen and being able to breathe and being able to get out of the situation that they are in so um I think I've gone through every mode and basically CPAP mode, if you guys don't already know, CPAP mode is just continuous positive pressure that's just given consistently at whatever you set. Like for example, you can put a BiPAP in CPAP mode. If I put like a pressure of 10, that's just basically me saying that it took a 10, it took a pressure of 10 for your alveoli to pop open and for you to get the proper oxygenation that you needed. So let's say for example, one patient might take a pressure of five to pop open their alveoli. Next patient might only need a pressure of 10. So that just means that whatever pressure it took to pop your alveoli open so you can properly oxygenate, that just means you're gonna get a consistent pressure of five all day, every day, until you got to come up off of that. So that is what CPAP is. It's just a continuous pressure of what's set on there. And I don't know if you guys saw in my other vlogs that I've had um, auto PAPs. The auto PAP can pretty much, you can set up pressure on there and you can also put auto. So what auto is, again, the name itself, auto PAP, you can pretty much put, the auto PAP will automatically adjust to whatever pressure is needed for that patient, that particular patient's alveoli to open up and for them to oxygenate well while they're sleeping at night. So me per, per se, I like to um, put the person in auto on those auto PAPs. I never set a pressure because again, I may have just got this patient and came in and never had them a day in my life. And I don't know what pressure it takes for them to um, 
get comfortable and 99% of the time you're going to get a patient that does not even know what they set at home on their home CPAP so it just works better for you to put them in automatic where it will automatically adjust to what their body needs to open up their alveoli to oxygenate them at night where there's no signs of apnea throughout their sleeping so it's like that's just pretty much you know very simple it's not really hard it's just that CPAP EPAP and PEEP all mean the same thing they're all stenting the alveoli open so that there can be proper gas exchange inside that way where the patient can oxygenate and ventilate like they're supposed to so that's just really something simple to, to make note of when you um are looking at the different meanings of what each thing means so it's fairly easy but once you get through that first hurdle of what all means the same thing it will start to make more sense to you and I'm hoping that this video is making sense to you guys too because everybody learns different so I'm hoping this video helps you as well so I think I pretty much talked about all the modes that I am familiar with that I've seen at my clinical sites so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the BiPAP now I did mention Mentioned earlier in the start of this video that the BiPAP can also be used as a ventilator and that mode is called AVAPS mode and what that does is it just prolongs the um, patient from being intubated like in a previous vlog that I did I told you guys that I had a patient that was on a high flow nasal cannula which is also known as a vapor therm it just gives more volume and more not volume but more leader flow and a higher FiO2 than the actual um, nasal cannula that can go up to one to six liters. And then you got another one that can go from seven to 15 liters. So it's all depending on the device that you have as far as what liter flow it can go to to help better make that patient comfortable, decrease their work of breathing, and also decrease the cardiac work that they're actually increasing because they can't breathe. So that's something that you have to also keep in account as well. So with that, this lady was on the maximum you can be on the vapor therm, which is 40 liters and 100% um, FiO2. So that was something that alarmed me when I first had her. So I most definitely talked to the nurse to get history on her to see if this was the first time that nurse had ever worked with that patient. So when she gave me the rundown, I pretty much messaged, messaged that doctor and let him know that what I saw from inspection from the door to the bed, this lady can't even move her arm before she desats in the 70s. 70. So before we knew about what AVAPS mode was, I suggested to that patient that she may need to be voluntarily intubated because the last time I saw a patient on the vapor therm and the, the non-rebreather, they did not want to be intubated, but they did want to be resuscitated. So that's something to keep in mind too, that a lot of patients that don't want to be intubated, they will be on something as crazy as the vapor therm and the um, non-rebreather. So I asked her and I also reviewed her chart to make sure she wasn't a DNI, but she was a full code. So I knew something, this whole matchup wasn't right. So I doc halo the doctor, I talked to him, he called me, I discussed what my my um, evaluation was clinically when I walked in the door, he wanted to prevent her from being intubated because her condition, he felt like she may not get off the vent once she's on it because of the condition she was in. But I suggested that she be transferred from um, the floor she was on, which was a regular floor, to an actual cardiac floor where she can be observed and monitored very closely and also with ICU being right around the corner. So that way, if anything happened where she needed to be intubated, she could be intubated right there and taken to ICU and monitored so much more closely in that area where she would need to be monitored by those nurses because of her situation. So after a while, she did. I don't even think we waited until lunchtime. He came up there. He saw her. He saw what I was talking about. And he transferred her and put in an order for her to be moved from the floor she was on to the actual floor she needed to be on. And that got her off of my floor because I was just starting off as a student um, intern. And that is something I didn't want to deal with because I had never been in a cold before as far as managing that myself until I got to clinicals this semester in my last semester where I had two colds in the morning when we got there and we had to jump in there, do compressions, bag, and do everything we needed to do. And we had to emergent, 
do an emergent intubation right then and there. So it was like we had to assist the doctor. We had to do everything. So at that point, everything that we learned in class, we had to implement in that emergency situation, not once, but twice. So that is why I always tell y'all, always pay attention in class because i know it can be hard and it can be very challenging but trust me if you take the extra mile to do other resources that will help you learn on what you need to do it will help you implement so much better in your clinical um routine and i mean in the aspect of just being able to jump in without being told to people pay attention to that not just the therapist that you're that's precepting you but the nurses the team everybody because we got compliments on us and how we jumped in there and did what we need to do and didn't even realize that we did so much more than what we thought we did by the end of that clinical day so it's very very important to pay attention to what um to what you need to do in the aspect of jumping in any type of situation that calls for you to actually do what you need to do as a student in clinicals whatever you feel you need to do it just doesn't matter you have to be on point so um long story short i didn't know anything about avaps mode but if i would have known that avaps modes was something that could be done on the ventilator on the actual bipap I would have suggested him putting her on AVAPS mode on that BiPAP, but he did order her to be placed on the BiPAP, but I don't think he knew anything about AVAPS mode because I surely didn't, but I particularly like AVAPS mode because that gives the doctors and everyone that's basically taking care of a patient that's in the condition that she was in kind of reevaluate the care plan for her if they want to avoid intubation they may can change medication therapy they may can look at other situations that could be contributing toward her condition to where we can kind of prolong the actual action of having to intubate her so avaps mode would have been very very um good for her and i'm not sure what happened after that because i haven't been um i haven't been on that floor since because I think the last couple of times that I was on the floor that she started off on, I didn't see her until the day that I came in. So I'm not sure if she ended up being intubated or being transferred to a different hospital, but more than likely, if I was to guess, I would say she probably ended up having to be intubated or maybe her situation was evaluated where they were able to, um, find out what was the issue as to why she was desatting so quickly with anything that she did and and i mean anything like picked up a fork picked up anything she just would desat really really badly and um like i said i didn't feel comfortable having her on my floor especially as a student not knowing what her situation was so when he did move her i felt a lot better because I felt like whatever I didn't want to have to deal with afterwards, you know, someone more trained that had that floor could do it. And I felt like that was the best decision, not just so much for the patient, but for myself. So that is something that you have to think about too. What is your comfort zone? And at that position, I already knew what was going to happen because we've had situations like this happen in clinicals where a patient we could already know and see what's finna happen and when the doctor didn't listen code the patient coded and we ended up taking them down there anyway so if you comfortable in what you know do the thing so that's pretty much it bipap i mean i'm sure you guys have probably already went over bipap it's just a bi-level um mode on the bipap that can that controls ventilation and oxygenation which the ventilation on the BiPAP is controlled with IPAP, oxygenation, EPAP. And the only things you would set on the BiPAP is, of course, IPAP, EPAP, um, the rate, and FiO2. You wouldn't set anything like tidal volume or anything because in order for a patient to go on the BiPAP, they have to be able to control their secretions and be able to um, breathe spontaneously. So that is a situation that you would have to always remember when you have a patient that may need to go on a BiPAP. Like, of course, the biggest thing is COPD patients, someone with obstructive um, sleep apnea and central too. But in the book, they will say that the first initial treatment for that is CPAP, which is which can be 
but majority of the time if the patient has a hard time you know ventilating their co2 is extremely high and they're a copd patient or have some form of an obstructive disease majority of the time those patients are going to be put on the bipap um but again abg will tell you what you need to what you need to know so keep that in mind as well and you can go anywhere you need to go because the ABG is going to tell you what you need to know and also key factor if you ever have a patient that was um, Taken from a house fire. Just keep in mind The PAO2 is going to be accurate. The SPO2 is not going to be accurate Because it's not going to tell you exactly what's going on and when a person gets to the hospital Then that's when you can order a carboxy um, a coox um blood run because it's going to tell you exactly what you need to know and with that i think the normal range for that is between one and three percent i believe so the blood gas is going to tell you exactly what you need to know pulse ox not blood gas yes it's going to give you an accurate reading on what you need to know when it comes to a patient that has been exposed to um, a house fire or anything of that nature that comes close to it blood gas is going to tell the truth spo2 is not going to be accurate because that was a big thing that confused me a lot on a test when they put down the house fire so keep that in mind house fire pao2 is going to be accurate spo2 is not going to be accurate so um, I'm going to wrap up this video right now and I'm going to edit it and put it up on my channel. I do have a day in the life vlog that I want to finish up this week and upload if not towards the end of the week. So I am hoping this video will probably be up first. Um, I'm going to continue making public posts for you guys if you feel like you want to make more suggestions. And I also have been getting a lot more suggestions under of under some videos on instagram and um youtube as well so keep like subscribe like commenting and subscribing on my channel because we are moving up in subscribers and i do appreciate that and like i said i'm going to keep thanking you guys every video that i make and um also i'm going to be doing the vegan videos as well too and before i go i want to show you guys the app on my laptop that i use to play with a little bit and just a small disclaimer I have not been playing with this app very long I just wanted to show you um, how it looks that is free it doesn't cost anything and that you guys can go on there and play with the four conditions that they have on there I think they have a normal condition you can kind of mess with the compliance you can mess with the airway resistance and you can mess with the weight female male neonatal all of that stuff and you can kind of play with a little bit and if you feel like it helps you great if you feel like it doesn't just let me know and then if there's anything else that you need that might be a little easier for you guys just let me know as well so i'm going to um show you guys real quick what it is and then after that i'm going to edit this video and i will see you guys next time so basically right here what i'm wanting to show you guys is that there's an actual patient sitting here and there are four different patient conditions that you can choose from there's vital signs there there's also the patient along with the ventilator g6 that we're using in this scenario so i'm choosing to do a copd patient i'm going to just keep everything that's defaulted already on this patient so we can go ahead and show you how this works and i'm going to full screen it so we can go ahead and start picking the mode um right now this is how the screen looks so this is everything that it gives you the opportunity to change make modifications with anything as far as the mode the settings the alarms any tools you would like to use 
on the mode, you see there's everything, but I'm going to choose SIMV, which we said is spontaneously giving the patient an opportunity to be more comfortable. I'm just putting in some settings that I did try out initially um, when I first started in this app to kind of give you an idea of how it works. So I just want to play with it a little bit and just show you guys what you would see, how you would play with it and how it looks after you put in everything. So that way, once you guys go ahead and download the app, you can kind of play with it yourself and kind of see how the different modes work. Um, right now, I've put in everything, confirmed it, and now I'm about to start ventilation. As you can see, all the vent settings in the bigger numbers are what the patient is actually doing spontaneously on the vent. And on the other side, where you see the little smaller numbers that's um, encased in the bubbles, that's what I set on the vent. So everything that you're seeing right now, the patient is doing on their own. I have not made any changes of anything, but I'm going to make a small change because I want to try to set the alarm off on here so you can hear how it sounds but um the only thing that I did do on here is I changed the pressure support and increased it a little bit but it didn't really make a huge change so um this is going to be it for the video right here I'm going to try to attach the link that I use to download this app to my computer but if you guys go on google and just type in what you saw on the screen when I first initially opened the app on my laptop you should be able to see exactly how to go from there but I'm going to definitely try to put the link inside um, below so you guys can kind of make it a little bit easier for you all and then hopefully that will be something that would help you be able to see how everything works and what everything that I did try to explain earlier in the video was helpful. Just let me know if it was and I'm hoping that it was. But again, there's always room for improvement because again, I am learning myself still. So if you guys enjoyed this video, please like, comment and subscribe. And also make sure that you um, just keep making suggestions of videos that you would want to see down the line. And I will continue putting these videos up if you enjoy them. Bye.